Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm a research scientist at MIT Sloan, and all my work is about ESG measurement. Um, <clears throat> when I joined MIT five years, five years and a half ago, um, we started writing a paper that's called Aggregate Confusion, the Divergence of ESG Ratings, and that was really the kickoff of our whole project that we now call Aggregate Confusion. The reason is, is because once you're in this ESG space, especially with ESG ratings, there's a lot of aggregation and hence everyone is a little bit confused, especially we were confused, so we thought that was a fitting name. Um, <clears throat> so then over the time, I read some other papers about measurement of ESG ratings, and now actually I thought um, that it was the time to write actually the paper about the impact of ESG ratings, especially on um, financial markets and uh, and firms, because most of the papers actually they look at um, the correlations between returns and and ESG ratings, but from a, yeah, but um, not actually really um, if ESG ratings actually when they change uh, what the impact on mutual fund holdings are, and then um, if the firms benefit from that, from those changes. Um, yeah, these G ratings, yeah. These G ratings are environment, social, and governance ratings, and they're basically an interpretation, or they're, they're, those ESG ratings, they take ESG disclosure from firm level disclosure, and put that in context because because where you pollute that matters, and they also try to figure out the intentionality behind it. What the company wants to do: do they want to reduce CO two emissions, or do they actually do not care about CO two emissions? Um, so that is that is what actually it's a little bit like judges um, those ESG ratings. And financial firms or asset managers they use them um, as a signal. Um, to figure out if a company is doing well um, in terms of ESG or not. So no. Right. no. And to prepare to talk about ESG, I have to show you the slide. Of course, um, the the integration of uh, the, the firms, the asset managers, the financial players that pledge that they will integrate ESG factors is growing massively. You have over more than 3,250 now um, signatories of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investing. That is actually a pledge that you, as a financial um, service provider or asset manager, you will actually um, integrate ESG in your analysis. And it also is now those, all those um, players, they have more than 120 US um, trillion US dollars UN. So that's massive. So the question really is, do actually those ESG ratings have an impact on their holdings? And um, yeah, so there's also a lot of theoretical research that has been done in the past uh, years. And all those papers, they basically um, have three predictions. If there are enough investors that have a preference for ESG, then they will tilt their holdings towards um, uh, good performers and away from bad performance. Um, if those, the second prediction then is, if the tilt is strong enough, this will actually have an impact on prices. So the preferences, if they're strong enough and everyone agrees also on what the signal is, then this will have an impact on prices. And third, if then, um, for example, this has an impact on prices, uh, that means high performers will have a lower cost of capital. Um, and that then this um, will benefit to the firms and they might actually then increase capex spending um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, they see they actually observe what we call the growth channel. And then there's the reform channel um, where actually they predict um, or those, those papers predict that if the companies actually observe that, um, that these G ratings have an influence on, on the cost of capital, then um, they will act according to, accordingly to that. So they will actually improve their ESG practices. Um, and we also investigate that in this paper. And basically to sum it up those findings, um, we find that ESG uh, mutual funds and ETFs, 
react to um, ESG rating changes, but very slowly, surprisingly slowly. Um, ESG rating changes have long lasting effect on returns. It also takes very long, surprisingly. And we do not find any evidence for this growth channel, so a change in capex, but we do find um, an evidence that they actually react to um, rating changes and change their ESG behavior. Now we'll tell you more about that. So this is related to the literature about preferences for sustainability, that, that preferences for sustainability affect um, uh, investors' holdings. You have um, Riedler and Smeets, they were a little bit the first ones in the journal of finance that um, actually really investigated if there's a, if, um, if, uh, if actually investors take into account social return in their, in their investments. And Hartzmark and Sussman about those, uh, they, they looked at um, if the introduction of um, labels or fund labels by Morningstar actually has an impact on flows. Um, and so those, those labels were ESG labels, but on the fund level. And then there's also the literature about the effect, effects of taste and divergent beliefs on asset prices. Oh, my French wrote a paper in the um, Journal of Financial Economics in 2007, and they showed if there's enough, um, if there's enough investors that build, that have a certain preference or belief that this can actually move prices in the stock market. Um, yeah, and then there's also it's related to the nascent literature on the effects of these G-vesting on corporate behavior in the real economy, and you have Bergman from this very. Let's say it's very limited. The divesting is very limited. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's. We actually looked at several ESG raters, and because our market that we look at is in yes, it is um, mainly the MSCI that matters. Anecdotally, that seems to be true when you talk to asset managers. Um, it also seems to be true when you look at um, when you look at studies where they back out the revenue from the different. Um, that, that um, those who own the, those rating providers, that they see the revenue that revenue share that they have from those ESG ratings. When you back that out, then it seems like MCI is the biggest player. And we confirm that later yeah. empirically. Um, yeah. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about the MCI rating. This is a little bit special in the sense it follows something that we call financial materiality. Um, compared to uh, double materiality, which would be more on a European approach. A lot of European raters have double materiality. Financial materiality is basically that um, the only concern actually about um, your, uh, the, the price of your stock or your market capitalization, or you're actually um, concerned about the, yeah, the profit. That's actually what the ESG ratings, the risk of the ESG risks that are actually, um, yeah, that are risk to your bottom line. That is what MCI is concerned of. In Europe, you have different raters um, that have something that follow double materiality, where they also look at what the company actually has as an impact on society. Um, so the MCI rating has is also very similar in some ways to all the other ratings because all ratings they have a certain set of key issues. Here in this case is 37, and they aggregate with a weighted linear average. And this, the weights basically depend on, on the different industries. Um, on, because certain, um, yeah, it's what we call a materiality weighting and, and certain issues in certain industries are more important than in others. For example, CO2 emissions are more important to aluminum factories than to office space providers. Um, yeah, so this, uh, so you have 37 key issues and um, each key issue is actually composed of a risk exposure score um, and a management, uh, a management score. So the management score is really truly what the company does and the risk exposure score is where the company operates, for example, geographically or in what industry. Um, and they aggregate and then it becomes one of the 37 key issues and that um, then is aggregated to the overall ESG rating. There are actually seven, MCI has seven categories, a little bit similar to credit risk ratings, it goes from triple C to triple A. And those are exactly those letter rating changes is what we investigate in this paper. Um, 
Um, okay, so first, um, the data set. So we use uh, CRISP, Mutual Fund Holdings, and we identify, we actually do a, um, a keyword search of um, nine uh, keywords. And they're the typical keywords that you would find um, in the name of an, of an ESG fund. Um, so it's SRI, social ESG, green, sustain, environment, impact, responsible, and clean and renewable. We then, uh, and also we, we exclude all the funds that are not, um, that don't follow capitalization growth, growth income, and income-based strategy. So what we do then is uh, we actually calculate um, the percentage of um, of the shares that those ESG funds own um, in terms of the total shares of the company of the outstanding shares of the company. And this is then our, um, this is what we use actually as our, yeah, um, as our measure. And for example, Tesla, the ESG ownership in Tesla was uh, 15 basis points in September 2020. So the thing is here, we only use ESG funds. Um, Mutual funds. So we do not we do not look at uh, pension funds or institutional investors in general. And so we very much likely underestimate this. And there is some indication that we do that um, on a couple of in a couple of slides. But what is more interesting for us is um, instead of really grasping what the whole ESG market is and how it's more like um, yeah, does actually ESG ratings move the market? at all. Um, okay, so the mean ESG ownership goes from four basis points to uh, uh, 12, 13 basis points in 2020. So again, this is BS. We're working now on, a, on an extension for Europe because in Europe, um, there's probably uh, three, four, five times more ESG invest uh, um, funds than, than actually in the US. So that's why it seems very small, but again, as I said, we are to make the market. We have 3,665 listed US companies, and we do have 4,679 ESG rating changes in those um, eight years that we look at. Okay, and now this is actually something that um, I was still surprised. I told you that MSCI rating is the one that matters, but I was still surprised how little the other matters. Here, what we did is we just calculated, those are all, um, uh, this is the coefficient for um, monthly, um, so we run a monthly regression for each month, uh, we run a cross-sectional regression for each month, and um, it's uh, the fund holdings on the ESG rate, so in the both levels. So we want to see actually the correlation, what actually, what rating explains most the fund holdings in the level. And we see that actually it's only MCI basically that is uh, significant because that is, um, yeah, the, uh, it should be pink, but uh, this is more violet here. And Sustainalytics, Moody's, ISS, and SP Global do not seem to matter, even though they're fairly big um, players as well in the space. So this is why we now actually um, just look in, our, in, in the following. Um, part of the study, we only look at uh, yeah, we only look at MCI and um, we do not look at the others. So we run panel event studies, um, and here on the left hand side, this will be first um, this ownership, uh, this ESG ownership variable that we constructed um, on rating changes. So um, B are upgrades and C are downgrades. And the window is uh, minus 12 months to plus 24 months. And we also add bins, um, uh, so lead and lag bins before to count, to factor in for, or to control for um, changes that happened previously and after. And uh, also, um, yeah, we, we then replace the, and then the step after we replace, um, we replace the, the, the ownership with returns, by and hold returns, and then also with um, uh, management scores that we construct ourselves. But I will show you that in um, future. We also control for, because it's a panel event study, we also control for 
uh, monthly fixed effects and um, and firm fixed effects, which in those studies is very rare because often there are so few changes in ESG ratings, it's really hard actually to, um, or most of those regression, kind of regression, they do not use firm fixed effects. Um, and here, those are the results for the mutual fund holdings. So this was really surprising to me um, because what we see here is actually that it takes up to 18 to 21 months for the mutual funds to integrate ESG rating changes. If you really truly believe that an ESG rating is source of is a risk measure or a source of overperformance, then you wouldn't wait one year and a half. So it seems that they integrate it as a preference. Um, but what you see is that, yeah, it actually the the upgrades. Um, means that the holdings increase, the downgrades mean that the, do, uh, the, the holdings decrease, and you also do not see a pre-trend. Um, yeah. So again, yeah. Um, how frequently are the ESG ratings updated by these? Since ESG reports only come out once a year, how frequently does MSCI people update their scores? Um, we have. Uh, I think there's uh, um, each firm has 0 0.6 um, upgrades um, on, on average in the sample. So they're very infrequent. We also, um, in, we also in, in robustness checks, I don't show them, but we control for um, controversies. So that is actually because you could think that there's a controversy happening and then it's just MCI reacting to the controversy. Um, and then this would um, lead to changes. But first of all, there's no real database that shows actually positive news um, that I know of in the ESG space. And we see um, that if I with the upgrades, it goes up. It's fairly symmetric here. Um, so that also indicates that it probably is not controversies. And since we checked, we can actually rule that out. Um, it's not controversies. Uh, that um, influence those MCI ratings. So it seems really that the market reacts to that the MCI rating as a signal. So now what we did actually, we run the same with returns. And here again, you see a reaction to upgrades and you see a reaction to downgrades. But again, it takes 18 to 21 months. So that seems it is not, it seems that actually it's a, a demand pressure. Um, channel the, through the so why the um yeah the those prices react um and that might be actually that's why we find uh um in all those studies where we look at where we regress return on on ESG ratings over the more, more than a couple of thousand that have been written now in the last 20 years might be actually just explained by flows um because none of those studies control for flows mm -hmm. Well, none that I'm aware of. Um, and I think this um, actually you can, yeah, you can see here. So that also means that, um, and the uh, actually the upgrades um, are followed by a 2.2% um, increase um, of return. And the negative is 3.6 roughly after 21 months. So um, that means there is actually uh, um, an impact on the prices. Of the of the stocks, and so theoretically, companies could benefit from a lower cost of capital, and they could react then via this what I call the growth channel. So they could react actually um, by increasing capex spending, for example. And we look at that, but we do not find any evidence that those ESG ratings in the this is actually measured now in quarters that um, in the two years after an ESG rating change that there is actually um, an increase or a, uh, a decrease in, in capex spending. So this is the growth channel, and we looked at the reform channel, where I said that ESG rate make that companies because they see that actually those ESG ratings have an impact on the stock price, that then they might actually actively try to change their um, their uh, the ESG ratings. For example, when uh, um, when, an, when a downgrade happened, they might actually work on by improving their practices to have, um, benefit from the future or from an increase in the MCI rate. 
And so what we did is we um, um, looked at, uh, so we reconstructed actually for each dimension, for the environmental, social, and governance dimension, we reconstructed the management score, where we took away all the risk exposure scores and just took an average of the management scores. So what actually the company really does in terms of, of um, ESG um, performance. And we um, looked again at those, if those, if the companies react to MCI letter rating changes. We do not find anything for E, we do not find anything for S, but we do find something for G. Um, and here's actually a trend reversal. You see, um, and that's mechanical. So you see that actually the, the rating here um, with the downgrade up there, the pink one, goes so that it goes down, then they have, there's a downgrade at zero happening, and then it goes up again. So it might actually, it, that indicates that the firms might actually react to um, the, as they observe that um, that uh, that they use the rating goes down, that they react to that and then do something in order to improve those governance management practices. And uh, the opposite is uh, true for the upgrades. Um, Okay, so um, basically there were three findings. So we showed that MCI's G ratings um, actually the changes really influence mutual fund holdings. That hasn't been shown before. Um, we showed that this is actually it takes very long time to integrate that um, for those asset managers up to eighteen, so one year and a half, which um, tells us it's probably more a preference story than actually a risk story. So they it's not as an ideal preference, I would say that those they, those asset managers don't really believe that this is actually a source of, of risk. Um, then we see that the same happening with returns. After one year and a half, there's an impact on returns, so on the market cap. Um, that actually indicates it's um, demand pressure that uh, or, or buying or selling pressure that actually um, drives up or drives down the price due to those ESG rating changes. And then um, we find that we do not find any evidence um, on the, by the growth channel. So we don't find any evidence that um, ESG ratings actually, when, when companies benefit from the low, a lower cost of capital, for example, from upgrade, that they actually then increase their capex spending. But we do find the limited evidence that they actually change their um, yeah, their governance practices when they, for example, when there's a downgrade, so that they truly do something um, in order to improve their, their ESG practices, or at least in a way that MSCI observes that, because there's also obviously a discussion between, um, yeah, they could just pick low hanging fruits, for example, and we're trying to investigate that at the moment. Um, yeah, thanks. So please, do you have any questions? I think I think the chance can. Which firms continue? Oh no, um, we we are, um, we looked at actually first of all we control on um, so Christian, and he asked if yeah. Could, I asked you, could, could you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, that's wrong. With it. So Christian asked if this lag is, if I understand correctly, if this lag actually happens because um, there might be, it might be, a, might be a thing of momentum where, for example, um, here they just uh, have several um, upgrades and that's why it takes so long. So we did several things. First of all, in our, um, in our, um, Panel event study, we controlled for several, um, if there are several upgrades or downgrades. And second, um, you, would, you would most likely see then a pre-trend. And third, um, uh, we actually, we, we just looked at companies where there's only one upgrade or one downgrade um, as a robustness check and you would still wouldn't, uh, you would see still the same, the same effects. So it doesn't seem to be um, momentum driven. Um, okay, the other, the other question, good question, Christian, 
could the lag also be, be just because uh, ESG AUM is growing over time? And I showed you this, right? Um, that could potentially be a problem here, but we also, um, so we also look at, um, we construct uh, the, the ownership variable a little bit differently, um, where we actually basically look at, we, we, we construct a synthetic, uh, so to say, ESG um, fund, overall ESG fund, and look at the percentage holdings in there. Um, so that makes it, uh, yeah, to, to exactly to control for that. And we do find the same, the same pattern. First, Tim. Do you have any questions? Do you have any other questions about these theories? I don't necessarily have to just talk about this paper. I mean, if you're, if you're here, if you have other questions about these theories. Yes. I mean, I've been added to uh, the previous question on the, on the ownership, like what drives the change in ownership. The time. Uh, I was wondering where you're able to look at um, whether within certain funds, uh, like well, at the strategy that certain mutual funds apply in order to identify the eligible universe. Because maybe the uh, like, if you look at the change of the ratings of the curves, some of them at the ETF stage just apply a certain index. So they follow a certain sustainability index. And if these indices do not follow exactly the MSA rating changes, were for their electrical constituents and also maybe change the weighting or whatever. Um, I think it makes perfectly sense to see a large lag um, between the rating change happening and the translation of that change either in the electrical universe of the time selected um, sample of firms or the indicator that the fund follows and then to the update of the fund metrics. It's basically a three-step process, right? Yeah. Two-step process. So that you're saying there's there's an index, um, and for example, they have a mandate to follow that index somewhat, and that's why it takes so much time. Yeah, and also the question is whether the index is tied to the MCI ratings, right, or not. Yeah. So if it's not, I mean, the MSCI index could, at the MSCI ratings could change as much as they want if the index uses sustainalytics uh, as an input, and the funds follow the sustainalytics in, index. It just does not reflect. Yeah, then we wouldn't see it. But yeah. we, we tried we tried all the other ratings too, right? And we wouldn't see anything. So it's really MCI seems to be dominating in the US. And I agree, it could be that um, those funds have as a um, just follow, have the mandate to follow a certain index, right? Or that is universe. And maybe some companies then get picked out. But there are a couple of things that actually. Um, indicate that that is not the case. Um, first of all, it's a slide I haven't shown because just of time reasons, but we do actually look at if um, the rating changes are taken into account differently if you're a laggard or um, a leader, means G leader in terms of MCI, and there's no difference. Mm -hmm. And so that means it is most likely, um, so you can be either like it can be just a mid change or a, a, for a mid company or for a leader or for laggard, it's the same. And so that tells me it's probably not driven by those um, or the, by those MCI universes because they are mainly only the constituents are just leaders, right? Um, then the other thing is uh, the other thing is I, I used to work in asset management in a very large um, asset manager, Europe's biggest actually. Um, and at the time, we had two billion in in, in AUM at uh, under when I started in, in ESG, and then we, we pushed it up to to sixty. And at the time, they were considered as really the leader in ESG. That was ten years ago, and it just took tremendous time to integrate those ESG ratings because they when ESG when MSCI changed them, they actually then the 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 team of extra financial analysts received them. That took uh, probably like already a couple of months. Then they worked on that, and they took their time for a couple of more months, and then they pushed it to the to the um, to the portfolio managers. And they portfolio managers were always complaining about ratings volatility because it creates transaction costs and also um, um, tracking error, right? But it has a cost for them, and I think this is probably it seems, and we have to investigate that. But it seems this this. The story is more driven by that, but that also means again 
that if you think that the tracking or error is a, is a heavy cost, then you don't think this ESG rating is a, is a signal of like future performance, right? So you do think it's more, you integrate because you have the mandate to do so. Again, then you see it as a preference. Two more questions. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, would be interesting to see whether the increase in ownership is driven by passive or active funds. Um, I would maybe guess passive because they are more rule based than active. No, it's actually both. Um, we separated them and uh, we haven't, we just uh, we've done that a month ago. So we haven't updated this um, because we we're working on a big uh, new draft at the moment, but it's actually both. It's really funny because when you look at passive funds, it's basically like this would be more like a straight line up and down, and mutual funds is then a little bit uh, looks a little bit more like this. Um, what you would expect um, because they are very good, as you said. Christoph, Christian, um, do you since you say it's more um, there's no as a real preference, it doesn't look like a good tool for risk management. Um, are they of any use at all? I do think yes. Um, I think they're bad for risk management for also other reasons because um, they're weighted averages. So if you, for example, if you Exxon Mobile and um, one of the categories is uh, oil spills um, and that only is 10% in ESG rating, why? That doesn't make any sense, right? It would be completely buried and compensated by other by other by other key issues and so are indicators. And so it, it just by construction is not a good ESG, it's not a good risk tool. But um, it can be a good tool for preferences because you might actually have a preference for um, um, for for ESG stocks. And this is also the only way if we if we ever want to achieve achieve investor impact then this goes through preferences. Um, so I do think there's, there's certainly um, a, reason that for, a reason for them to be, to exist, um, but maybe not at a, at a risk pool. That is not, I'm not saying, and I'm also not saying that um, ESG rates are uh, bad. I think they're very important in this ecosystem. You need them, but um, maybe you shouldn't look at the, this aggregate of an ESG rating if you really want to use it in risk management, but you should look at the different indicators. Um, and I think this is really important. Um, is there any other question here? Because there was one more here, but uh, maybe that's the last question. I'd love to chat with you after. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost just Okay, so um, that says, what is your residence topping are you looking to research next. I think here at this paper, there's a lot of things to be done. Um, and I think this is uh, digging deeper into um, why this actually takes so long, truly. Um, and also the, uh, in the end, um, so with the CAPEX, I think there should be, um, we wanna get more, a better analysis is because we wanna look at actually if, um, if, if companies raise funds actually, and what they then do. Um, and if that's actually linked to ESG rating uh, changes, we also look at, we want to look at IBS, so um, forecasts um, of, uh, yeah, sales forecasts, brokers forecasts, um, if that actually ESG rating change, if they are taken into account. And we also, um, I think we want to go down a little bit deeper to see actually why, um, how companies react to ESG rating change in the governance dimension. Um, because I do think, there's obviously, if you react, if you want to react as a firm, I've, since I put that paper online, I got approached by Deloitte and by PwC actually, because that's exactly, I mean, that feeds exactly into their, their pitch, right? Uh, you, you increase your ESG rating by a notch and your market cap goes up. So that's a, that's a good sales pitch for them. And um, they actually told me that there is actually something like the company's going for low hanging fruit, right? If they want to, because they know or they want basically what they ask Lloyd and PwC is um, how can you actually increase, how can you increase our, our ESG rating with very little cost? And it might be that it's just in the governance dimension and it's something related to, yeah, I don't know, um, something that you can change easily. Between the chair and the chief. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, for example, right? Chief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And 
So I think that's it. Right, and that's you correctly. Yeah, I was just saying that the um, UK government now consulted on uh, regulation, potentially PSQ ratings, partly on the, the basis of your paper. Uh, I'm just wondering if you still felt like central regulation in this space affects the nature of this relationship and references and decision making in the future. Good question. I'm actually, I, I was fairly involved in, um, in with uh, the RMF, who was really much in Brazil, because they were the first ones four years ago to really want to regulate these G ratings. But um, they're French, so they wanted to standardize them. And uh, I think that would be a very bad approach. So I think I'm very pro standardizing ESG disclosure because that's, we need to agree on how we count CO2 emissions or uh, the gender pay gap. But then those rule as a, those, those, those function as a judge, right? You do not want to regulate that because, or you want to standardize that because there's so much measurement error in there. Um, as we show in our this first paper, that the, the biggest source of disagreement is measurement. So that indicates we do not know how to measure all those things perfectly. So if we standardize them, first of all, we would standardize 40 measurements. And so we would stall any future innovation. Um, and also half of those ESG ratings are actually also um, how you define sustainability, right? So what in indicators do you look at? Um, what, what materiality do you look at? And if you standardize that too, um, I mean, every, that doesn't make any sense because everyone is entitled to their own preferences. I think the, so standardization doesn't make any sense. And, but what I actually, what was really interesting in all this work with those ESG raters is how intransparent they are and how little actually I know about the measurement methodologies, even though I've worked on them for six years. Um, and uh, I think, so some of the writers that we have in our database actually could not even give me a PDF that explains, or presentation that explains their methodologies. And I think this is what the regulator has to do. It has to, uh, the regulator has to force transparency because only then we can criticize them in a productive way. Yeah, I think that's basically the, the pitch I always push forward. And AMF, after long discussions, they actually agreed, and that's what they fought for, and this is what's happening now in the, in the um, probably in the, in the European Union as a regulation. So that's good. Um, and there's also another paper I wrote about retroactive changes in the database. Um, um, you might have come across an infinitive database um, where they just retroactively change like even 10 years. So you download it today and you download it next week. And then there's a score that changes uh, 10 years ago. And um, even on like granular data, because it's an investor pay model. So they want to show that um, obviously they have the highest correlation between financial return and ESG return. Uh, and ESG ratings, ESG performance. And I think that is also something that um, you should regulate. And we were also in contact with, uh, at the time with, uh, with the SMA. So apparently the, the European Union will start ruling on this, I think in June or July, or setting out like a proposal, um, if I understood correctly. Um, yeah, and so this will be actually, I think those are the two key points that um, they should actually enforce. Oh, I'm Jimmy. I, I did the comparability work on the greenhouse gas protocol thing. Oh, okay. um, but, um, so a number of papers, this one that you're talking about, I know Sarah Flynn also has one as well, which shows that ESG ratings will end up with, you know, have a positive correlation to returns, to ownership, to, you know, good things in the financial markets. Are you familiar with papers that show ESG ratings having positive correlation to actually environmental improvements, governments, governance improvements, or social. I think this is the first, that's why we tried to write it, right? Um, because, uh, I mean, it would go through CapEx, right? If there was something. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think so. I think the, the biggest problem actually in the whole space is not greenwashing. I think the biggest phase, problem in the space is what we would call maybe impact washing. And this is the implicit promise that all what we do here changes something in the real world, right? And the, there's no research that really shows that. Um, and it's even worse. Um, so there is actually a lot of confusion, I think, between firm level impact and investor impact. So firm level impact would be, for example, if you buy an, an MSCI ETF, right? You own a certain footprint. Your footprint, like an impact footprint, right? It can be greenhouse gas emissions, but it can be anything diversity. That might be better than, than the S&P 500, but 
the fact that you bought this actually does that change anything? This is the real question, right? This additionality here, I think this is the real question. And I think there's literally to not no research on that. Yeah. It's really sad actually. Because the link between financial return and and, and ESG, there are like three, four thousand papers at least that have been written on this, yeah. at least. But and they're all looking at it from a mispricing perspective. But I don't buy this mispricing perspective. I always that that's why I've tried look to investigate holdings because I do think it's a uh, um um this mispricing because there, there's so many people looking at ESG ratings. How can there be still a, a mispricing problem? ESG risks. So and I I personally really do think that um that in, I mean, the returns look the same, right? But I do think that studies basically find this, and when they stop here, then it's actually an overperformance. But if you stop maybe here, which we can't do, then you would maybe actually see lower expected returns in the future, right? And so it's basically a flow story, which is great because the flow story also, since it's a preference, it would mean that there might be actually a case for impact because then firms have a lower cost of capital. Because you drive up prices, lower cost of capital, and there might be actually a case for impact. But that we have to see in the future. Yes. Um, on the CapEx story, um, I follow your point entirely that uh, like most of the theory of change relies on assumptions that if you change the cost of capital, uh, it will cost more or less incentives to invest in change their business model what capital they use to implement and run their business. Um, did you also check whether an increase or a change in capex afterwards uh, is associated with an increase or a downgrade in the ratings? Because it could also be the case that the entire uh, chain of argument runs the other way around. Yeah. And also, um, more from a corporate finance perspective, um, I'm wondering, in addition to this capex channel from the investment side, what that means actually, like if you have to increase or if you increase your capex, I mean, that's first probably detrimental to your equity ratio. Um, and you could also just use the, um, the lower cost of capital to increase, um, I don't know, dividend payments or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, this change in the cost of capital does not necessarily translate into capital exchanges. Yeah. And also the incentive to translate it into capital exchanges is pretty low, I think, from a corporate finance perspective. Yeah, but that would be, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, but this is really, we really want to look at this real world impact. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it might be just going into dividends, right? Yeah. But that wouldn't be what actually ESG investors really want, I think, if you ask them. Yeah. And if you check the, the other way around, whether you observe increase or decrease in capex in certain areas, probably, I guess it's difficult with the data, but maybe if there was data on certain parts of the businesses that have been expanded or the capex went into, whether there's a certain decrease or downgrade in the ratings afterwards. So um, like if you say capex indicates a real positive um, impact mm -hmm. i mean it needs to be capex that's for the good right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that too yeah yeah that's that, that but since we don't find anything we, we stop there but um then if we find anything then yeah. we would actually we would have looked at if it goes into something like green patents or if that green patents following or those kind of things right so we also thought about looking at that but there are some other papers that start doing that actually that's like in the literature and if you look at capex first, and then how capex impacts the rating changes, is there any? No, we haven't done it. But that's a good. That's a that's a good. Um, that's a, that is a good thing. Um, that we somehow want to do that in another paper. So, mm -hmm. um, what actually we want to look at what actually causes rating changes, yeah, and how they optimize for that um, those firms. Because I think there's a as I. Yeah, anecdotally, a lot um, from those consultants that that's basically what firms want. They want to maximize the ESG rating without any cost. Mm -hmm. yeah.
You can check whether there's any correlation with the OPEX because everything related to governance, I guess, is mainly reflected in OPEX. In? In OPEX. Oh, yeah. Okay. Not necessarily in CAPEX, right? Yeah. So maybe it would be worthwhile to identify what's, depending on the E, S, or the G dimension, the relevant um, flow that you would. Not yes. So what we did is now for the G dimension, we looked, uh, we started, we almost added that to our database is more like granular data. So we're actually, because uh, G, uh, the G dimensions are made out of six categories in MCI. So I want to look at which category, or which key issue that is. And um, once we do that, then we want to actually dig a little bit even deeper because those key issues, obviously, they have, they're also like uh, a lot of different data points. So we really want to find that out, but this we, we're going to do for sure. Mm -hmm. So really, yeah, this is, I think this is, this is probably the most important part of the paper, but also the, uh, this is the one thing that we want to do and what I'm really excited about is, uh, is Europe. Because I think there's much more heterogeneity in Europe and it's also more, probably more influence in Europe of these two countries. Because the market is so much bigger mm -hmm. in Europe. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Yes. Um, I, so Christian says there is research that um, shows that higher stock prices, lower cost of capital, and large ownership base does change real economy outcomes. Therefore, it should be that ESG, if ESG affect those factors, that um, meaning ESG should have um, uh, um, yeah an impact on the on the real economy. And um, yeah, I. I would agree, but I couldn't find that link. Um, so maybe it's just too weak. Um, but I, yeah, hopefully, I would say that's the only thing I can say here, Kristen. Um, but I do see, I, I, I do agree with your point for sure. Agreed. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. No, that's good. Um, Oh, that was actually one hour. So, um, okay. I'm, oh, yeah. If you could, could you do the thing of the uh, improving the ESG rating does not lead to a enough uh, re uh, reduction, uh, enough reduction of the cost of capital? Yeah, it could be. Or it could be, as she said, um, it's just used for something else, right? Because maybe also, yeah, because maybe the company, they don't need more capital because they already have a lot of cash, actually. And, They've already done any, everything they want, right? Which is a little bit yeah. confusing, yes, too. And do you have any idea where, where if they don't increase the capex, do you have like a punch of where the money is going? I think that's what she said. Probably dividends, um, buying buybacks, stock buybacks. Yeah, if that's a case of that cash, but um, no, yeah. But if they, if they, but they have to first benefit. They have to first if you, I don't know. No, they, they wouldn't be stock buybacks because they wouldn't need to issue. I don't think it's maybe they don't do anything with it. I probably that's the most likely. No, they, they yeah. Since it's a higher stock price, I think the only thing that, yeah, they don't do anything. They just don't change it. There you go. Because dividends wouldn't, yeah, they wouldn't. I, I don't know about how much a company would actually uh, uh, should get or uh, um, stocks to. Finance dividends. Yeah. So you just say that basically that they prefer to keep that in cash than to. Sorry. You, prefer, you think that they prefer to keep that in cash than to. No, they, they, they don't. They don't even. They don't even take. They don't even receive more cash because I don't think they act on it. Yeah. Just because your stock price mean goes up and the, um, the cost of capital is lower, it doesn't mean necessarily that you okay. benefit from it, right? It's just. Uh, I think there's also like we should actually here the interesting part is also um, what part of the stock uh, the cost of capital is actually impacted, right? Is it equity, cost of equity, or cost of debt? Um, that is also something we have to investigate. I don't, um, yeah, I, I could see both normally, but I, to be honest, I really don't know. I think for the paper, it would be really great to investigate the different channels, like where you would expect it, not, not just the, the growth channel as a growth channel in general, but more differentiated, like which channel of the growth channel 
Yeah. And also probably the we did we did look at a couple of things. We also did mm -hmm. a research and development, mm -hmm. but we didn't find anything. So we just chose habits to give. Them. But we did look at several things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We didn't find anything. It's also it might be the horizon, right? It just seems like this is a what two years, right? Um, and maybe it just takes more time because actually the the here the the benefit from the low cost of capital really like after a year and a year and a half then we only look at so technically you should actually we should actually start looking at here something mm -hmm. it takes some time right all that cost of debt Christian cost of debt may be the more important channel for capex as most capital is raised to debt markets by a factor of like five. And that also, yeah. and I think the literature has shown these generating link with cost of debt. Yeah, yeah, I wrote a paper about that. <laughs> um, I don't know. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you for the discussion. And it was really good. It was really, <laughs> I really yeah, I would love ideas. Um, but also, ideas how we're going to rewrite the theater in what way. So thanks. If you have any questions, yeah, please.